Well, praise God, everybody. We want to welcome you to our new members orientation class on baptism. On baptism, we've always already gone through some of the introductory things, so we're going to get um, get right into it. Baptism is one of the ordinances left by the Lord Jesus Christ for the church. Um, when I say ordinance, there's two of them. One is baptism, the other is communion. And these are two um, sacraments uh, that were left, formal things that we do to identify with Christ as being Christians. And they're just not invitations, but they're also commands. These are two commands that the Lord Jesus Christ gave the church that through these we would be able to identify with Him as our Lord and Savior, express our belief in Him as Christians, and then what I want to focus on today is not just how you become a Christian, but the benefits of being a Christian. There's so many people, this class is specifically on baptism, there are so many people that have gotten baptized, and some of them were baptized when they were very, very young, and especially in a Baptist culture where we emphasize you know, baptism as a, as a means of being a member of the church and joining in the church. But what I've seen throughout my 28 years of ministry is that there are many people that got baptized but didn't understand the benefits of baptism. They got baptized and they really didn't have the revelation or the information concerning the, the real power of baptism. And for them, it was just a, a way to join the church. And you'll see that it is one of the means that God has given us to which we are connected to his universal church. But there are some promises concerning baptism that once you have the Bible truths on it, that you'll be able to take full advantage of. It's like an insurance policy. If, if, if you buy the policy, pay for the policy, but still don't understand the benefits of the policy, then you can't take advantage of what's been paid for. Well, Christ has paid for salvation. He has. He shed his blood. He died on the cross to give us an abundant life, to pave the way for, for us to be overcomers in this life and in the life to come. But there are many people that don't understand the benefits of it. And so they have an insurance policy, the premium policy, the best you can have, paid for in full, but they're living like paupers. They're living defeated. They're, they're, they're living in sin. They're, they're living in weakness. They're living in sickness and in poverty, not understanding that baptism was designed to release all of the power of God available for you in this life and in the life to come. Amen. So how many of you excited this morning about learning more about baptism? All right. Praise God. So not only is it, is it an exciting time for me, I know it's got to be an exciting time for you because it represents a greater commitment that you're getting ready to make. And you get ready to go deeper in the things of God, release the benefits of God for your life, and walk into a, a life of service. So there's, there's one other sacrament that we do that a lot of people think uh, that, it, that it's also one of the commands that God left, and that's foot washing. That's foot washing. So we have baptism, we have communion as an ordinance, and a lot of people try to add that third one of foot washing. But the reason they do is because salvation is always synonymous with service. And these ter first two ordinances of baptism and communion, they emphasize the grace of God that's available to you for salvation. But a lot of people think you just get saved and wait to die and go to heaven. But the example that Jesus left for us is that salvation and service are synonymous. So it's my prayer, my commitment that as you are going into a deeper commitment with God, no matter what your age level may be, uh, no matter what your maturity level may be, no matter how long you've been in the church, that my, my hopes and my prayer is that you're getting ready to go into a greater place of service. Amen. The, does that make sense to anybody? Praise God. So we, we, we're not just wanting members, a whole church full of people, two, three, four thousand folks sitting around on their stools of do nothing. Uh, that's not serving God with their life, that's not honoring Him with their lives. But when you're really, truly born again, you take on the nature of Christ, and the nature of Christ was a servant. Amen? Amen. So let's get into this. Here's, here's kind of the breakdown for the class. Um, i got a few stories that I want to tell up front in this first session. And the reason I've uh, elected to tell stories is because a story can be worth, a picture can be worth a thousand words. 
And so I got some word pictures here that, that are going to kind of paint a picture of what baptism is and what baptism is not. All right. And then after that, we're going to show some real biblical examples from the word of, you know, Christ is our example of baptism. There's some Old Testament examples of baptism that give us the true reality of what baptism means for us as New Testament believers. And so many times when we think about baptism, I don't think uh, that we that we think to go back to the Old Testament and get those examples that God put on record uh, for us to be able to understand the revelation of what we have as New Testament believers. So I want to do that. I want to share some stories, grab some Old Testament examples, and then show you some New Testament examples, even Jesus Christ himself, and open that up to you so that you understand what baptism is really all about. So, first of all, a couple of stories. Everybody likes stories, amen? <laughs> all right, the first story I want to share with you today. Ah, uh, my. Where do we want to start here? The, the baptism of the drunk. The first one we're going to talk about will be the baptism of the drunk. The drunk man who got, who got baptized. Here's the story. A man was stumbling through the woods, totally drunk, when he came upon a preacher baptizing people in the river. He proceeded to walk into the water, bumped into the preacher. The preacher turned around, and though almost overcome by the smell of alcohol, as the man was currently drunk, he says, are you ready to find Jesus, my brother? The drunk answered, yes, I am. So the preacher grabbed the drunk and dumped him in the water, pulled him up and asked him, brother, have you found Jesus? The drunk man replied, no, I haven't found Jesus. The preacher shocked at the answer, dumped him into the water again, held him down for a little longer. Then again, he pulled him up out of the water and asked him, brother, have you found Jesus? <laughs> the drunk answered him again, no, no I I haven't found Jesus. By this time, the preacher was at his wit's end. So he submerged the drunk once more and held him down for about 30 seconds this time until he began kicking and his arms and legs began uh, just going all over the place. And then he pulled him up. The preacher asked the drunk man again, for the love of God, have you found Jesus? The drunk wiped, wiped his eyes, caught his breath, and finally said to the preacher, are you sure he fell in here? Because <laughs> I, 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 I ain't found Jesus yet. The moral of the story is, there is a better way to find Jesus, amen, than dunking folk in the water. That's to say that just because you go in the waters of baptism don't mean you find Jesus. The reason you should be going into the waters of baptism is because you already found Jesus. Amen. Amen. Getting baptized does not make you saved. Are well, you feeling me? Amen. All right. The reason you get baptized is because you are already saved. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward commitment. And so I want to let you know I don't plan to hold you down until your arms and legs start wailing. And I'm not expecting you to find Jesus when I put you in. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But I'm putting you in because we're believing that you already have a knowing relationship of faith in God. Are you with me? Amen. All right. All right. So that's the first story. That's the first story. Uh, the second story is a story that's called sinless perfection. It's called sinless perfection. Someone told of a church that believed in sinless perfection. Once you trusted in Jesus Christ and invited him into your life, and you were baptized. A visitor to that church heard this teaching and asked to be baptized. He was tired of dealing with his habitual sin without any success. Unfortunately, it was in the middle of winter, and the river was nearly frozen. The man with much persistence got the elders to baptize him in the frozen river. After the man and the two elders came up out of the freezing water, the man was so excited, he said, I feel so good, I ain't even cold. One of the elders turned to the other and said, he's still lying, we gotta do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Having a right relationship with God does not make us robots without free will. We are forgiven, praise God. 
The Bible says he takes our sins and he casts them into the sea of forgiveness. He makes a decision, God does, to never remember our sins anymore. He doesn't do that. But getting baptized does not prevent you from sinning. How many, how many of you understand that? Getting baptized does not prevent you from sinning. And getting baptized is not going to make you do the right thing. Amen. Are you with me? Now we're, sick, we're sharing these stories because again a picture is worth a thousand words. But also they set right expectation for why we're going down in the water. A lot of people think, man, I'm making this decision. I'm getting ready to be baptized. My whole life is going to be better. It's going to change. And I ain't going to have to do nothing. I'm just going to feel good about it and be good about it. And all my problems going to go away because I went in the water. And that's not the case. Amen. Again, there is a benefit to being baptized. There is an expectation that you should have as a result of coming into a greater commitment with God. And there will be some tangible results based on your faith level that will change and shift after you come out of the waters of baptism. But the, uh, I guess I'll save that point for the next story. Uh, there's no power in the water. Amen. There's no power in the water. The power is in, is in your faith. It's in your faith in the word of God. So let's do that then. Let's, let's go to, to the next story. It's not the water. <laughs> Little Betsy had faithfully attended baptism classes. Her mother wanted to be sure her daughter understood its significance. She asked, honey, what does baptism mean? Well, it isn't the water that makes you clean. She began smiling. The mother thought, yes, my baby got it. She understands it. Then her daughter added, it's the soap. <laughs> the baby said, no, it ain't the water that make you clean. And the mother said, she got it. She said, no, it's the soap. Well, we ain't putting no dishwashing liquid in there. Ain't going to be no time to get the dirt out. <laughs> no cheer, no game. Ain't no soap in the water. There's no power at all in the water. It will be heated, though. We, we have heated it. It'll be heated up overnight. So that we'll try to make it, especially in the cool temperatures, as comfortable for you as, po as possible. But there is no power in the water. The water itself has no redemptive value. That's why you can put people in the water and they don't change. Amen. You can put people in the water, a sinner, and they come up a sinner. A cheater, and they come up a cheater. A liar, and they come up a liar. There is a benefit to baptism. When you go into baptism with a commitment to serve the Lord, to honor the Lord with your life, and a faith level that's based upon Scripture, that's based upon what you can expect from the Word of God. You can, if you understand the benefits of it, and you have faith for what God has said, then you can have an experience in baptism that is indeed life-changing. But it will not be because of the water. Are y'all feeling Amen. me? Amen. Praise God. All right. <laughs> so we baptized a drunk and found out he didn't find Jesus. We talked to a little girl who thought it was in the soap, found out there's no power in the water. And we've talked about sinless perfection, realizing that the water itself doesn't make you some robot that just automatically does the right thing because you got baptized, that you still have to have a heart and make a decision to serve the Lord. Let's look at this next story. The next story is called Dead or Alive. It's called Dead or Alive. It's a story. When elderly Adele Gavery turned up missing for years, four years ago, concerned neighbors in Worcester, Massachusetts informed the police. A brother told police that she had gone into a nursing home. Satisfied with that information, Gavery's neighbors began watching her property. Michael Crawley noticed her mail delivered through a slot in the door, piling high. 
When he opened the door, hundreds of pieces of mail drifted out. He notified the police, and the deliveries were stopped. Gabri's next door neighbor, Eileen Duggan, started paying her grandson $10 twice a month to mow Gabri's lawn. Later, Dugan's son noticed Gabri's pipes had frozen, spilling water out, out the door, so the utility company was called and, um, <clears throat> to shut off the water. What no one guessed was that while they had been trying to help Gabri, Gabri had been inside her home all along. When police finally investigated the house as a health hazard, they were shocked to find her body. The Washington Post, 10-27-1993, reported that police believed Gabri had died of natural causes four years ago. The respectable external appearance of Gabri's house had hidden the reality of what was going on on the inside. Something similar can happen to people. We may appear outwardly properly dressed while being on the inside spiritually dead. All sorts of religious activity may be happening outside while the real problem is missed, spiritual death on the inside. Here's a woman who had died and all of her neighbors did their very best to keep the appearance of her property looking good. They thought they were doing her a favor. Cut the mail off. Shut the water off. Cut the grass. Doing all these things to help out. And all it did was delay the investigation, prolong the inevitable. No one had enough relationship with her to know this or to know that she was dead. And the reason I put this story in here is because more people are concerned with what people think about them than being concerned about who they really become. And Christianity is not about what you look like only, but it's about who you are. It's not about dressing up the outside and having some religious look, um, the way you, you wear your hair, or the clothes you put on, or whether you put on jewelry or not, or makeup or not. Uh, there should be a change on the inside that works its way to the outside so that people notice that there's been a true change in your life. When Jesus confronted the Pharisees, here's what he said about them. He said, on the outside you are whited sepulchers, but on the inside you're full of dead man's bones. Baptism should happen in your life as a result of getting cleaned up on the inside. Amen. I'm not concerned with having a church full of religious folk, people that look safe, respectable in the community drive nice cars, live in nice houses, wear labels on their clothes. A whole lot of people look the part, but inwardly they have weak characters, poor integrity, perverse morals, and there is no real indication that coming up out of their life that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The reality of what we're trying to do today is to make sure that you're in a position where you've had an encounter with God in your heart. That you, where you've had a relationship with Christ in your heart that produces a change inwardly that works its way outwardly. Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. Praise God. I don't want you to be a good-looking house full of death. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. The final story that I believe we're going to share today is called The Unbaptized Arm. The Unbaptized Arm. Now, it's a little bit more of a lengthy story, but it um, has a very, very weighty meaning. And so that's why I've included it in the lesson, the unbaptized arm. Some of you have probably heard me minister on this story. It makes a very poignant point. Here's, here's the story. Ivan the Great was the Tsar of Russia, kind of like a king, ruler, president. He was the Tsar of, of Russia during the 15th century. He brought together the warring tribes into one vast empire, the Soviet Union. As a fighting man, he was courageous. As a general, he was brilliant. He drove out the Tartars and established peace across the nation. However, he was so busy waging his campaigns that he didn't have a family. He didn't have a family. His friends and his advisors were quite concerned. They reminded him that there was no heir to the throne. And should anything happen to him, the union would shatter into chaos. They said to him, you've got to take a wife who can bear you a son. 
the busy soldier, statesman said to them, I don't have time for a wife. I don't have time to search for a bride. But if you find me one that's suitable, I'll marry her. <laughs> Amen. So the counselors and advisors searched the capitals of Europe to find an appropriate wife for the great Tsar. And find her they did. They reported to Ivan of a beautiful, dark-eyed daughter of the king of Greece. She was young, brilliant, charming. And he agreed to marry her sight unseen. My God. The king of Greece was delighted. It would align Greece in a favorable, favorable way with the emerging giant of the north. But there had to be one condition. You can't marry my daughter unless you become a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. Ivan's response was, I'll do it. Amen. I'll marry her. I'll become a member of your church in order to marry your daughter. So the priest dispatched to Moscow to instruct Ivan in the Orthodox doctrine. Ivan was a quick student and learned the catechism in record time. Arrangements were concluded and the Tsar made his way to Athens accompanied by 500 of his crack troops, his personal palace guard. He was to be baptized in the, into the Orthodox Church by immersion, complete dunking, complete sub immersion in the water, as was the custom of the Eastern Church. His soldiers, ever loyal to him, asked to be baptized also. The patriarch of the church assigned 500 priests to give the soldiers a one-on-one -on -one catechism crash course. The soldiers, all 500 of them, were to be immersed in one mass baptism. Crowds gathered from all over Greece to see this historic occasion. What a sight that must have been. 500 priests, 500 soldiers, a thousand people walking into the blue Mediterranean. The priests were dressed in black robes, tall black hats, the official dress of the Orthodox Church. The soldiers wore their battle uniforms with all of their regalia, ribbons of valor, medals of courage, and their weapons of battle. But suddenly that was a problem. Suddenly that was a problem. The church prohibited professional soldiers from being members. They would have to give up their commitment to bloodshed. They could not be killers and church members too. Now we have a dilemma. Hmm. Look at what he says. After a hasty round of diplomacy, the problem was solved, quite simply. As the words were spoken and the priest began to baptize them, each of the soldiers would reach the, down to his side and withdraw his sword and lift up over his head, high above his head, every soldier would lift up his fighting arm and his fighting sword. Everything would be baptized except the fighting arm. Everything would be baptized except the, the sword. This is a true historical fact. It has been known throughout history as the unbaptized arm. What a powerful picture of Christianity today. How many unbaptized arms are here this morning? How many unbaptized wheels are here? How many unbaptized talents? How many unbaptized checkbooks? Social activities? How many people are here saying, I'm willing to give up everything but this? The unbaptized all. Baptism is about full commitment. It's not about convenience. It's about sacrifice. It's about coming to a place of surrender. You may not even fully understand how you're going to do it. But it's about your will. I want to do it. I want to surrender my whole life to the Lord. I'm not going to go into the waters of baptism consciously saying, God, you can have everything but this. Yeah. Amen. Are you feeling me? I'm not going to consciously go into the waters of baptism saying, Lord, I give you me, but I got to hold this back. 
How many people have done that? Many have done it. But I'm thankful today that all of you are going all the way in. Who's going all the way in? <laughs> Amen. Praise God. All right. So uh, those are my stories for today. And, and I painstakingly do that because people, uh, statistics would say that people remember st stories longer than they remember facts. Amen. Are you with me? Stories have a way of lingering and sticking with you. Uh, sometimes longer than principles. All right. So tell me what you heard. Give me some feedback. What did you hear about from the stories? What's your takeaway? Anybody? No matter. That when we're baptized, um, when we go in, like you said, we got to go in all the way, not saying, Lord, I'm going to hold on to whatever it is that we love the most. Yes. For instance, just things. Yes. But we're giving all, the, everything to God, sins, the good things, the bad things, the ugly, all of it. We just got to let go and just let God just take control of our lives in order to be committed to Him. And Amen. Him. Great takeaway. All in. Give them the good, the bad, and the ugly. I love it. Amen? Amen. I felt that. That's your commitment? Yes. I love it. Anybody else? You said you said. <laughs> I, um, I think um, what I have heard was that you do have to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You really do have to sacrifice. Um, when I got baptized at the age of 13, I done it because I, me and my sister we went together, mm -hmm. and um, that was the thing to do to get baptized. And by you getting baptized at 13, and I wasn't explained or introduced to the reason why, but I just done it because. Mm -hmm. And then after I got baptized, I know once I went to church, I had to go to work. Mm -hmm. So I went to work as an usher. You know, I took in different jobs and stuff. And mm -hmm. I know I wasn't supposed to sit there, but I didn't know the real reason of baptism. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now by, by me being 49, mm -hmm. and you teaching me so much, mm -hmm. you know, it is it, it, making me say, you know, it's time for me to go back and rekindle all this and go all in and give God everything. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. I've been through a lot. Amen. And so that's my sacrifice. Amen. To go all in. Amen. I love it. I love it. How powerful was that? Amen. I love that. Thank you. Great takeaway. I love it. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Excuse What's the difference between being sprinkled and baptized? That's a, that's a great question. And the question she asked is, What's the difference between sprinkling and immersion or going all in to, to the water? And I, I want to say to you that the one thing it's not is a tool of divide. And I say that because this one question has been, has birthed different denominations. Uh, they can agree on the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but not on how to be how to be baptized. Uh, some believe you sprinkle. Some believe that if you don't get fully immersed, that you haven't truly been been baptized. Again, I think what's most important is the commitment that is being made when we understand that there is no real water, no real power in the water. Okay, there's no real power in the water. Uh, traditionally people did immerse in the Bible. But they also, there were times when, when there was not enough water for immersion. And you had to use what you had. And so I see, historically, I see both of those principles being used. Amen. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I just said? I see both of those principles. So I will not, in my heart, allow that to be uh, an instrument of division between that, that, that bursts different theologies and different denominations and brings walls of, of divide. Um, but I understand why the Bible talks and the actual word, as I get into some definitions here, the actual word baptizo in the Greek means to submerge. 
It means to submerge. The actual word means to immerse or submerge. Because one of the one of the the meanings of it of baptism points to not only what is happening with us in salvation, but also what is happening with us as we relate to God in intimacy with the Holy Spirit. See, we want the Holy Spirit to baptize us. We want to be fully immersed in the grace of God. We want to be fully immersed in the power of God. We, we, don't, we, don't, want, we don't want the power of God just sprinkled on us. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, in, in times past, in the Old Testament, the power of God did not come and immerse everyone. The benefit that we have as a New Testament believer is to be saturated with the Holy Spirit from the inside out to the point where he rests fully on us and empower us. And so it points to not only the benefits, and I'm going to get into some of this in my teaching, but just a, a, kind of a short answer. It points to that we take on Christ. We are being baptized into Christ fully. We are fully immersed in Christ. Nothing left uncovered. So that's the, that's the picture. Again, because there's no power in the water, it's, it's really my faith in, in, the, in, the, in the word that's going to determine whether I'm being fully immersed in God or not. It's not the water. I don't know if that, did, did that make sense? If I understand what God is after, God is wanting me to be fully baptized into Christ. That's why the word baptizo means to be immersed fully immersed to be merged but it really has very little to do with the water it has to do with you understanding what God's will is and you having faith for God's will that I'm about to take on Christ totally I'm about to be fully immersed in Christ and then I'm going to be fully immersed in a relationship with the Holy Spirit where I'm saturated with him from the inside out amen does that make sense there, there's some scriptures in the Bible that point to this when it talks about being in the waters that are ankle deep, that are knee deep, waist deep, and then deep enough to swim in. See? And that's what this baptism is a picture of, to be in a place where, where the water is so deep that I have no control. I have given all of my control over to God. My feet are no longer on the ground. I'm, I'm, I've put myself completely in his care. And in his hand. I'm in the waters now that are deep enough to swim in. That are head high. Does, does that make sense? And so don't let the doctrines or denominationalism bring divide. What, whether, what would happen if we were in a place. Here's a, here's a good picture. If I was in the desert. Because this has happened in the desert. In, in Iraq or Afghanistan. A soldier wanted to accept Christ. And they wanted to be baptized. And all I had was a canteen of water. <laughs> all I had was a canteen. But, but he was concerned that, it, that he could die any day. And he wanted to accept Christ and be baptized. Could, could I not explain to him the benefits of baptism? And take all the water I had. And pour it out on him. And immerse him. By faith in Christ? Or would he have to wait because of some religiosity for me to find a pond or a river or dig a hole? Mm -hmm. See, that's religion. Don't let religion bring divide and keep us, rob us from the benefits of, of God. Use what you have. Understand the power is not in the water, it's in the word. And activate that person's faith. Amen. And just realize that my intent is to be fully immersed in him. And that's why I, 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 I use the water because of what it points to. Praise God. Great question. How many of you understand the answer? <laughs> All right. Now, I saw you had something to say just a moment ago. <laughs> you, you, but you don't have to share. But do you want to? You don't want to? Okay. All right. So let's, let's go deeper there. All right, what, what time frame are we on? I want to do the definitions, and then we'll take our first break.
because time flew by. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's do the definitions here, and then we will we will take our first break. Definitions for that we're going to be using for the class. The first one that we just finished going through was the defin definition of baptism. It comes up out of the Greek word baptizo, baptizo, which means to fully immerse or to submerge, to make one overwhelmed, to make one overwhelmed. Amen. And that's what I'm talking about with the waters that's deep enough to swim in. It's kind of hard to drown in a cup of water, but you could drown in waters that are deep enough to swim in. Amen. You, you could be overwhelmed with that water. Does that make sense? So again, the power is not in the water, but it points to the picture of what God wants us to do. To be completely immersed in Him to the degree that we are overwhelmed with His grace. Overwhelmed with His mercy, His love, His power to transform our lives. Not just sprinkled with it. Everything God does for us, He does exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. He gives us abundant grace, abundant mercy, abundant love, abundant life. We are overwhelmed with it. And so that's the picture as we are baptized in Him. Another word is washing, washing, washing. And it comes up out of the Greek word lutron. Come on, say with me first of all, baptizo. Baptizo. Amen. Say immersed. Immersed. Or overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. All right. The other word is lutron. Come on, say lutron. Lutron. Amen. Like Louis Vuitton, but it's Lutron. <laughs> Lutron. And it means a bath. It means a bath. Literally a washing or a cleansing that takes place to being immersed in the Word of God as an instrument of spiritual cleansing. Amen. Being immersed, again, the word immersion continues to pop up all around baptism. And I'm going to show you some word pictures after the break from the Old Testament that again gives us this picture of being overwhelmed or submerged or immersed. Praise God. Uh, the, another word is regeneration. Regeneration. And this implies spiritual rebirthing. So there's a new birthing that takes place. A spiritual birthing that takes place. Another word is renew. Renew. These are words that are synonymous with baptism. Renew. Renew. And it, it means to be transformed, where all things become new. All that to be transformed is the power of transformation. So there is literally transformational power released if you have faith in the water baptism. Amen. Praise God. Another word I'm going to show you from the Old Testament is token. And, and, and it talks about evidence or a signal or a mark that is put upon you. A mark that is put upon you. That's one of the things that happen when you get baptized. It's an outward showing to the public. You literally become marked as a Christian. In the realms of the spirit. That's why this is not necessarily a good thing for people to do. Many churches take this very serious. If there is not evidence in your life that you've had a born again experience. That you know Christ. They will not baptize you. Because when you get baptized you get marked. Amen. When you get baptized, you get marked. And, and I can't wait to talk to you about that in the, in the Old Testament. But I, I, I'll share this, this. That was the final definition. When, when, I was in, when I was in the Marine Corps, I learned, out, learned that the officers wore a quadrifoil, what they call a quadrifoil, on the top of their hats. We call them coverings in the, in the Marine Corps. And from the top, they had something that identified them as being officers. It identified them, it marked them as being people of authority. Well, there's all type of insignia that's on them that marked them um, as being people of authority. Well, they had to begin to tweak that throughout history, throughout war, because not only did it alert the friendly forces to know who had authority, but it also alerted the enemy to know who had authority. And the enemy during times of war would seek out the people who were marked. Yeah. You smite the head, 
the sheep will scatter. So they had to begin to make some adjustments to the markings so that the you know that that we would understand who had authority as friendlies, but that it would be more disguised to the enemy. Well, I brought that to say <coughs> to you that when you get baptized, you put a mark on your life that shows God I'm a part of the family. Covenant blessings should be flowing to me. But you also put a mark on your life that says to the enemy, I'm a covenant member. I should expect greater persecution, greater attack <laughs> coming my way. Because he begins to target those that are marked. And so it's not really wise to mark people who are not ready. Amen. Does that, does that make sense? You, you don't have to be afraid of the attacks of the enemy. Even for the little ones that, that go into this by faith, the Bible says especially the little ones that God assigns his angels. His angels are in heaven beholding his face daily that are assigned to the little ones. So God fights on their behalf. But it is important for you, parent, to know that as you make greater commitment, make greater surrender, come into a covenant relationship, you're going to begin to attract greater grace on your life, greater mercy, greater favor on your life. But you're also going to attract greater opposition because the enemy understands this covenant mark. Amen. God bless Amen. you. With that being said, take a quick 10-minute break, 5 minutes, 10 minutes at the most. Come back. And then we'll finish out this, this session. How many of you enjoyed this so far? Amen. God bless you. Amen. We'll <laughs> <pray. laughs> all right. If you all are ready, we're going to um, go into our last session. And I promise you, it'll fly by just as fast as the first session is. <laughs> and we'll be done by noon. <laughs> if, if not before. Okay, so my phone is on. And my Bible is up. Okay, so are you all ready? Huh? Yeah, I'm good. All right, I want to welcome you back to a new members orientation on baptism. On baptism. First session was awesome. Thank you for being a great class. Y'all made that easy. And I went by real quickly, and we're going to get into the second session, which will probably go just as fast. We focused on in the first session on stories that kind of painted the picture for us of what baptism is, and what it is not, and then we focused on some definitions, and we had some great feedback and great questions. Thank you for that. Um, in this session, I'm going to focus on Scripture. I'm going to focus on the Word of God, examples from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And up out of that will, will emerge the promises of God, the expectation that we should have when we go into the waters of baptism. Amen? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. All right, so the first question we want to ask today is, who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? And what Scripture... Amen. That we can go to that, to answer that. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 39. Here's what it says. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now this is Acts chapter 2, 37 through 39. And it answers the question, who should be baptized? The answer is simple. Everyone. Everyone that has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone whom the Lord our God has called. Amen. But hidden in the text as well is, is an expectation. Verse number 38. Peter said unto them, repent and then be baptized. So baptism comes after repentance. And repentance, of course, means a change of heart and a change of mind. Turning back to God. Turning back to God. Repent and be baptized 
every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look at what Peter included along with baptism. It was the expectation of the early church that synonymous with baptism would come greater intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and conjunction you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Didn't even have to ask for it. Didn't, didn't have to beg for it. Didn't have to wait for it. Didn't have to try to clean yourself up to get Him. He, the Holy Spirit, was part of the package. Amen. He, the Holy Spirit, immersing you, um, overwhelming you, was part of the package. Greater intimacy with the Holy Spirit is synonymous with greater surrender to God. Amen. So I want you to have faith for that. I want you to have faith that as you're submitting to the waters of baptism, that essentially you're surrendering to God and making yourself a candidate for a greater encounter, a greater communion and intimacy with Him, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be open to that. Believe for that. Believe for that. It was synonymous with the early church. And when they got baptized, they received a greater experience with the Holy Spirit. So who should be baptized? Everyone. Everyone. <clears throat> Everyone that believes. Everyone that's called. And our expectation after being baptized is that we should have greater intimacy with who? Don't be afraid. You can say his name. <laughs> Great, greater intimacy with who? God. God through who? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. Specifically, God through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, he says something here that's very important, and I want to bring out two, two things that, that you'll notice distinctions between the two verses I just read. Jesus gave this as the mandate of the church. Don't go and try to add church members. You just go and make disciples. The mandate for the church is to make disciples. In order to make disciples, you got to do what we're doing right now. You got to train. You got to teach. You have to instruct. You have to instruct. And part of that was baptism. Go to all nations, make disciples, baptizing them. Baptizing them. All right? So baptism essentially gets you into that discipleship process into that, that process where you're not just a church member, but you are one who is like Christ, one who can do what Christ does. You are a disciple of Christ. Amen. I want you to notice a distinction here. In the first verse I read in Acts chapter 2, Peter said, be baptized in Jesus' name. <coughs> Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Another source of contention between many denominations who are Christian denominations. Some believe that in order for you to be baptized, you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. Others believe that to say in the name of Jesus is wrong. To say, you got to say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Again, I believe that this is a trick of the enemy. I want to introduce a word to you called machinations. Machinations. It simply means all of his schemes, all of his tricks, all of his devices that he tries to use to trip us up. And we got people arguing about how to baptize instead of just focusing on the mission, which is to baptize. Everything we do as New Testament believers, we do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it would, be, it would not be wrong to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible teaches us that in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead. So it is implied, when you say Jesus, it is automatically implied, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. 
Okay. Does that... <laughs> Amen. Now, some people don't know that, and they don't mean that. They believe that you have to just say in Jesus' name, and they don't understand that in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All right? That when you say Jesus, you imply Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And they have made a distinction there to be baptized in the name of Jesus only, not inclusive with the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That would be wrong. That would be error. Um, amen. So Jesus himself said, when you baptize, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What you'll oftentimes hear me say, and you'll probably hear me say it tomorrow, we're going to have you state your full name. You'll state your full name, and I'll say upon the confession of your faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Praise God. I could just say in Jesus' name because of my understanding in the revelation of Scripture and include the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But for some people that would be an offense because they don't understand that in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So you'll oftentimes hear me say in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, and you'll hear me come back and say in Jesus' name, Acts chapter 2. <laughs> and so you now you understand where those two things come from. Are you with me? All right. Praise God. All right then. Y'all tracking with me. So let's look at Jesus very quickly as our example. Jesus is our example of being baptized. Matthew chapter 3. And this story is also told in, in the Gospel of Luke as well. Um, <clears throat> then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan. This is verses 13 through 17. To be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said unto him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he followed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now I want to use Jesus' example for you to give you some expectations that you should expect after the waters of baptism. He is our example. The first thing I want you to know is that if Jesus submitted to the waters of baptism, then that is additional confirmation that each and every one of us should. He's the sinless Son of God. So He did not submit to the waters of baptism to get rid of sin. He had no sin in Him. But He did submit to the waters of baptism to fulfill all righteousness, to, to obey the mandate of God, and to leave us an example. Amen. Praise God. Being baptized is not optional for a believer. It's a mandate. It's part of your obedience. You understand, we understand that. Jesus was obedient. He submitted to the waters of baptism out of obedience. As a result, some things happened sequentially in his life that I believe that we can expect. When he came out of the waters of baptism, the first thing that was open over him was the heavens. Now, the heavens have been open ever since. Ever since Jesus opened them, they, they have been open. But what that means for you is sometimes it feels like as a believer that prayers don't get through. It it's, feels like sometimes as a believer we don't have the connection that we need, the intimacy with God. It feels like the prayers are hitting the roof and bouncing down. We can't sense His presence. We, we can't sense the fellowship with Him. Anybody ever been there? All right? So it's almost like there's a barrier. What baptism does for you is because of the surrendering that you have come to, it should remove that barrier. It should remove that blockage. And as a result, some things happen. You begin to experience the Holy Spirit came upon him, and it was not a dove. It was like a dove. <laughs> okay? The Bible says it was like a dove. It wasn't a dove. It was, he, it, he was like unto a dove. And he sat upon him and he abode upon him. So again, just like Peter just said, 
baptism of the Holy Spirit was synonymous with baptism in water. We get that. Jesus got baptized in water. The Holy Spirit came to him immediately. Peter said to the New Testament church, Baptism, Holy Spirit. Baptism, Holy Spirit. Now this is just blowing some of what we know out of the water because most of us in a Baptist economy, in a Baptist culture, we have not been taught that we should actually expect greater intimacy with the Holy Spirit as part of the package. That is synonymous. Not just punching my ticket for heaven, but when I get baptized in the waters of baptism, I should expect an empowering, overwhelming, immersing, intimate encounter with the Holy Spirit. It may not happen immediately, but it should be your understanding that you're getting ready to walk into a greater knowing of God or greater communion with God through the Holy Spirit. It's part of baptism because you need Him. Baptism doesn't come. Baptism in the Holy Spirit doesn't come so that you can have a goosebump experience. So that you can jerk and fall out on the floor and flop like a fish. It, that, 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 ain't, that ain't where the Holy Spirit comes from. Guess what He comes to you for? To empower you for service. And so baptism again is synonymous not just with salvation but with service. The reason you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit is because He is the power for service. Amen. Are y'all with me? He is the power to serve. Jesus did not do any miracles until after he was baptized. After he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him and immediately he was tested and he, and he passed the test. And he went into service. Baptism marks you. You will be tested. This commitment that you're saying you're about to make, it will be tested. But you'll have everything in you to pass the test if you want to pass it. And you'll have a greater grace for service. Are you with me? Are you it's feeling like it? Of, um, um, it's like a shield of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Like he's shielding you for your sacrifice. He's, yeah, I, I, yes, yes. He, he is on Better word, he is honoring you. He is, he is honoring you, absolutely. He is honoring you. And you cannot work for salvation. How many understand that? Ephesians chapter 2 says, Salvation comes by grace through faith, not of works. Baptism would be considered a work, something you initiate, something you do. So <coughs> baptism cannot save you. So everything that you, you get from God that is free comes through salvation. All right, hear, hear what I just said. Everything you get from God that is free comes through salvation. The, the saving experience. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you get born again for free. You get saved for free. You get your sins forgiven for free. You get brought into the universal family of God for free. Even if you didn't make it to the waters of baptism, I believe that if you died right after you accepted Christ, I believe you'd still go to heaven. I, I do. Why do I say that? Because there was a man on the cross with Jesus who got saved on the cross. And, and he didn't get a chance to get baptized. But Jesus said to him, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Amen. How many understand that? Amen. But baptism is essential for service. See? That greater surrender, that greater commitment that I bring and give to God, now we're into works. Now we're into works. Salvation doesn't come through works. But the other things that is released to you for God, God is responsive to your faith. He's responsive to your faith. He, he is. You can't manipulate God. You can't make God do anything. But he responds to your faith in him. And baptism is a faith move. Saying, God, I'm surrendering to you because I believe in you. I'm giving you myself. And God, in turn, responds to your faith. And he releases to you a greater expression of himself in the form of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Now, two, two different things happening here, very quickly. When you get born again, even before baptism, when you get born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. He does. If you're saved now, the Holy Spirit is alive on the inside of you. He is the agent of salvation. He is the one that regenerates you, that makes you born again. He's on the inside of you. Romans chapter 8 says if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you don't belong to Christ. So we're talking two different things. The Holy Spirit living in you is not the Holy Spirit immersing you. The Holy Spirit living in you is not the Holy Spirit baptizing you. There's a difference between having the Holy Spirit in you because you've been born again versus having the Holy Spirit baptizing you because you have surrendered to Him. Two different things. Amen. Two different things. So the picture that we're seeing now is the Holy Spirit overwhelming you because you have submitted yourself to Him and now you are having an encounter with Him that empowers you for service. Not for salvation, but for service. Baptism prepares you for Christian service and for victorious living in the earth. Not for heaven. Y'all looking at me strange. <laughs> Baptism does not punch your ticket to heaven. If it did, then every one of us would have to have that same ticket punch. Because God is not a respecter of persons. He's not, he shows no impartiality. He's just. And if that was the way to get to heaven, everybody would have to have that same ticket. And the scripture gives us indications that there are some that got to heaven without having that ticket punched. So baptism has more implications for your life in the earth than it does for your life in heaven. Y'all with me? <laughs> oh, y'all understand what I just said? Y'all hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> okay. All right. So, good. Jesus is our example. All right. So, the heavens were open. Greater intimacy with God. The Spirit of God descended like a dove, but He wasn't a dove. It's the Holy Spirit. The next thing He heard was the voice of God. The voice of God. Again, greater intimacy. Hearing God speak. This is my beloved Son. Affirmation. Getting that affirmation. God coming and affirming to you. I see the commitment you're making. I see the, the surrender that you have. I'm affirming you. I'm confirming you with my presence. I'm affirming you with my voice. You should expect that. You should be, expect to be able to have greater intimacy that yields the voice of God. I, 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 it was, I was grown and already had been in ministry for several years when I learned that, that as a Christian I could hear from God. They didn't teach that when I grew up in the Baptist church. They didn't, they, didn't te they didn't even teach that in the Pentecostal church that I was in, that I got saved in. Even though they placed great emphasis on the Holy Spirit, they, they did not teach that, I, that as a Christian I had a relationship that, that yielded the voice of God for me personally that I could expect to hear from God. I was in ministry several years when I ran into a man of God that asked me, what is the Lord saying to you? I said, what is the Lord saying to me? What do you mean what the Lord is saying to me? What is he saying to you? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know, I, nobody had ever asked me that. What is the Lord saying to you? I know what the Word says. I've been preaching what the Word says. But what he's saying to me, that's intimacy. That's relationship. I didn't know he was supposed to talk to me. Ah, yeah. You should expect a greater intimacy that yields the voice of God in your life. You as a believer in a covenant relationship with God can hear in that still small voice. Now there are many ways that God speaks, and that's another class. He speaks through visions. He speaks through dreams. He speaks through his word. He causes it to become alive, rhema. And he speaks to that still, small voice that bubbles up on the inside of us. That gives us a witness of what God is doing and what God is saying. But he does speak with clarity. He speaks prophetically. He speaks through the Holy Ghost and tongues. There are many ways that God speaks to the church, but God speaks. And you should have an expectation that God is about to start speaking to you. 
in greater in a greater capacity. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just want just want to make sure make sure you was open. All right. So affirmation confirmation came and then testing came and then power came. And then power came. All right. So now let's look let's look at some consequences. Some consequences of a lack of commitment. That's where we're going now. And then we're going to look at some symbolisms from the Old Testament very quickly. And then we're going to um, look at a couple of benefits. And then we'll be done. All right? And then we'll be done. So just giving you a little road map of where we are and where we're going. Consequences. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church, and here's what he says. He says, well, I don't want you to be unaware. Well, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, that our fathers were all under the, the same cloud, and they all passed through the same sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So I want you to see this very quickly. Here, Paul is talking to them about an Old Testament occurrence, and he uses the word baptized. He's talking to them about the children of Israel who came out of Egypt through the Red Sea and wandered in the wilderness and came into their personal promised land. And he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Our fathers were all baptized. They were all baptized under the same cloud. Under. See? Under it. When they came through the Red Sea, that was symbolic of being overwhelmed. It was symbolic of being immersed. Does that make sense? Amen? Amen. So he's, he's, giving, he's about to give us a picture, and I don't want you to miss it, of a whole nation of people who got baptized but didn't get the benefit of the baptism. Amen. Don't miss it. A whole nation of people that got baptized, and the majority of them, the vast majority of them, died without ever realizing the benefit of what they were baptized in. And there's a whole bunch of folk been in the water. And a lot of them never got the benefit in the earth of, of why they were baptized. Look at what he says. He says, all were baptized unto Moses. How many of them were baptized? All, all of them. They were all, every one of them got baptized. More than a million people. More than a million people were baptized. Unto Moses, in the cloud and in the sea. Look at what it goes on to say. They all ate the same spiritual food. <laughs> they all ate the same spiritual And they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So here they've been baptized. They are relating to Christ, even though they don't know they're relating to Christ. Christ is with them. He is following them. When they need manna, he gives it from heaven. When they need food, manna comes from heaven. When they need water, water comes out of the rock. And that Bible says that rock was Christ. Christ is the bread from heaven. Christ is the water from the rock, a rock in a weary land. They're with Christ. They're relating to Christ. They've been baptized, and still they don't get the benefit. A lot of church folk I know right there. <laughs> I'm telling you. They come to church to eat the same meal that everybody else is eating. They hear the same sermon that everybody else is hearing. They're in the same worship environment that everybody else is in. And they're not getting the benefit. They're not getting the benefit. Now, he says, but nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. Baptized, eating, drinking spiritual food, but God was not pleased. Look at what he goes on to say. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. In other words, they died in the wilderness. Now these things took place. This is why I'm reading this. Verse number 6 says, Now these things took place as examples for us. <laughs> 
we, we have this indication or, or this incident in the New Testament as an example of what not to do regarding baptism. An example of what should happen with people who are being baptized. A whole nation of people got baptized. But God wasn't pleased with them and they died in the wilderness having never gotten the benefit of what they were baptized for. That's serious to me. Amen? That's serious business to me. Look at what it says here. They took, that we might not desire evil as they did. So, so for those of you that, that's taking notes, one of the things that you should expect to happen as, as a result of surrendering to God is your desires should be changing. Your desires should be getting transformed. Even though they got baptized, they still desired evil. They, they, got, they went in the water, but they held up their desires. They said, yeah, but, I, but my, my appetites, I'm not submitting that. I want my appetites to stay the same. <laughs> yeah. Their desires were still evil. Look at what it goes on to say. Verse number seven. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and they rose up to play. They didn't take it serious. Verse number eight. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell, were killed by God in a single day. Now, now, this is not Old Testament. This is New Testament. This is, this, is a, this is a New Testament scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, God talking to us about what it looks like to truly have a surrendered life, to do those things which please God, and not to be like the people that he left on record for us that went through the motions of it, but had lifestyles that didn't please him, had desires that were evil, and it showed up primarily in sexual immorality. And as a result, 23,000 were killed in one day. And God did that to them as an example for us. To leave on record that even though we're under grace, saved by the blood of Christ, God still hates sexual perversion. He still hates sexual immorality. And it still bears about consequences. Amen. We must not indulge in sexual immorality. Some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test. Don't try God. Don't, don't, don't charge God foolishly as some of them did. How do I do that? I charge God foolishly by saying, Lord, I know what you expect of me. I know you want to help me do the right thing. But I'm going to go through the motions of religion, pretend like I want to do right, and all the while in my heart, I have no intention on doing so. <laughs> Don't charge God foolishly. Don't put God to the test. Wow. Bible's got a lot to say, don't it? <laughs> if we just have a heart to hear. Amen. Look at what it's, look at what it says. It's the same scripture. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor be grumblers, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as our example, but they were written down for our instruction. On whom the end of the ages has come. God did what he did to them to instruct us. He, he used their failure as a life lesson for us. And if we had an ear to hear today and a heart to receive, we could learn a lot from somebody else's failures. Don't, don't charge God foolishly. Look, look at what it, it finally. Therefore... Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. 
Verse number 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but that is common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted above what your ability is. But will, with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to bear up under it, that you may be able to endure it. Just because you get baptized doesn't mean temptation won't come. It, it doesn't. Temptation comes to expose to us what's still in us. Amen. Temptation is drawn to you, the Bible says, because of your desires. Your hidden desires. The, the only thing that makes it a temptation is because there's still something in you that wants it. Hey, hear me somebody. It wouldn't be a temptation to you if there wasn't something in you that desired it. What's a temptation to one is not a temptation to another. The Bible says every man is tempted when he is enticed and drawn away according to his own lust. It, that word means strong desire. That's all it means. Lust. What you desire strongly, you attract to your life. And temptation is something that reveals to you what still needs to come in alignment on the inside of you. Baptism doesn't stop you from being tempted. It doesn't. They'll, they'll come. But what it does do for you, if you have a heart to honor God, is it gives you the grace you need to be able to bear under the temptation, to win in the temptation. And if you continue to get your mind renewed and your heart renewed, to deal with the desires that attract the temptation. Amen. Amen. You just have to be honest with yourself. You, know, you can't lie to yourself. <laughs> like, I don't even want that. You lie. <laughs> I don't do that no more. You think about it all the time. But you don't have to lie to yourself. God knows what's in you. He knows what's in all of us. The temptation comes so you can know what's in you. They'll, they'll keep coming, but the grace of God will flow to you because every temptation that's coming to you is common to man. Other people have overcome it through the grace of God. You can overcome it through the grace of God. Yes, you can. It's common. You're going through the same thing everybody else. Somebody has gone through it, and they, and they defeated it with, with Christ. You can defeat it with Christ. If you allow God to change your heart, renew your mind through the word of God, but when we go into the waters of baptism, we are submitting our wills to Him. Not all, our ways may take a while. <laughs> they will. The, the ways may, may be a process, but the will has to remain submitted to God. And here's what God says. He says, it is Christ that works in you, both the will and then the do of His good pleasure. You've got to first have a will, then you get the do. And baptism is about will. Lord, I will serve you. Lord, I will honor you. I will surrender to you. And as a result, start looking for the grace of the do. Now help me to do what I said I will. <laughs> Does that make sense? Now Lord, help me to do what I said I will. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I wish somebody would get that. <laughs> Don't you beat yourself up after you come out of the water of baptism and think, man, it didn't work. <laughs> That's the do. But what we're dealing with today is the will. Amen. Submit the will and then let the grace of God flow to you for the do. All right. So we're almost finished. Symbolism of baptism. Because we only have like about 15 minutes left. <laughs> it's going really quick. Symbolisms of baptism. Old Testament. Symbolism. We just saw one Old Testament symbolism of baptism when the people came through the cloud and they came through the sea and they were all baptized unto Moses. But still, they didn't please God. Genesis 17, verse number 10, 10 through 14. Another really important symbol of baptism that gives us light as to what we should expect and anticipate in the New Testament. Here's what God says. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. 
And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in your house or bought with your money or any stranger which is not thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with your money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh. My covenant shall be where? In your flesh. In your flesh. For an everlasting covenant and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. He has broken my covenant. And so here we have God bringing the people into a covenant relationship with him. He's a covenant keeping God. He's a family oriented God, a relational God. And he gives them a sign of the covenant, just like we do when we get married. We give a ring in our economy, and the ring is a token. Token, it's a token of the covenant. How many know the ring doesn't make the marriage? Amen. Just like baptism doesn't make your salvation, the ring doesn't make the marriage. But the ring is a token of, uh, with this ring, I be well. Amen. It's a token of my love for you. It's a token of my commitment <coughs> to you. My desire for you, to be with you forever, to love you, honor you, cherish you, sickness and in health, richness or in poor. Amen. Uh, my token. God has always given tokens. And I think it's just ironic that this too is a token that is round because that circle is the circle of covenant. It's a circle of covenant. Now when God got ready to have a family in the Old Testament, he did the same thing. He said, I want to cut covenant with you. And this is what I want you to do. I want every single male, eight days and up, to cut the covenant in their flesh. I want them to carry the sign of the covenant in their bodies. In their bodies. And so he prescribed that the male genitalia, we're keeping it PG. We don't know what that is. Explain it when we get home. Amen. <laughs> That the male genitalia would be circumcised from eight days and above. Any servant that was purchased from the time you bought it with your money would have to be circumcised. Every male in your house would have to be circumcised. And anyone that was not circumcised would break the covenant and would be cut off from the blessing. Okay. Do you understand that? So why would God require for them to wear a ring around their genitalia? Literally put a ring on it. Because it's a sign that I'm honoring you with my body. I'm honoring you with my life. The covenant is in my body. It's in my flesh. I'm giving you what you desire most. Which is not my money. Not even my service. You desire me. Me. Myself. That's what God wants. He wants you. If it gets you, he gets your service. If it gets you, he gets your money. Your time. He wants you. God required them to cut the covenant in themselves. In, the, in their own self. It, 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 here's what it indicated. I cannot do with my body what I want to. I have to honor God with it. It was a reminder that I walked with eternally. That when I looked at it, it reminded me that I'm not my own man. I belong to God. Baptism should be that type of sign in your life. You should mark the date. It, it's, it's, it's just as important as a wedding date. Or as a birth date. You should mark it. It's a sign of the covenant. From this day forward, God, I'm honoring you with my body. Amen. And I cannot do <clears throat> with my body what I want to. Amen. Do we understand that? It's the seal. It's the mark. 
that is on you that makes you distinct. Now, now there were many, there were many other cultures in that time frame that were operating in circumcision. The, the Israelites, the Hebrews, weren't the only ones that were that were operating that were practicing circumcision. They weren't. They weren't the first to practice circumcision. They weren't the only practicing circumcision. But God said, for you, this is what circumcision gonna mean. For you, circumcision is gonna be the mark of distinction that makes you mine. For you, baptism is the mark of distinction that says to you, I'm going to honor you, God, with my life, with my body. It makes you his. I'm yours. And you, and you should mark it. Mark it on your calendar. Mark it on your calendar. What Old Testament circumcision was to Israel, New Testament baptism is to us. Amen. Now, this is one of the reasons why I don't, why I do child baptisms. I, I do them. If a child wants to get baptized again when they are of age, I, I, I'm, I'm all for that. But that eight-day-year-old baby had no idea who God was. Amen. God said, I want you to bring them to me at eight, eight days old. Let me put the mark on them. I want them to grow up with the mark on them. That's an indication that they're under my covenant. That's one of the reasons. And, and then the parent was responsible <laughs> for providing them with the information <coughs> of what the covenant meant, of what they were involved in, what they were connected to, instilling it in their hearts, but they carried it in their bodies. God said, any one of them that don't have it don't belong to me. And I believe Old Testament circumcision is parallel, symbolically, to New Testament baptism. It brings you into the covenant blessings of God. It marks you for it. Amen? Amen. Ah. <clears throat> just introducing, just introducing. The flood of Noah is also symbolic of the baptism. The Bible talks about it in the New Testament that Noah's flood was symbolic of baptism. Y'all know what happened in Noah's flood. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 6, My spirit shall not always strive with man because he also is flesh. My spirit shall not strive with him because he is flesh. And the perverseness and immorality that come up before God is a stench in his nostril. And God used the flood to cleanse the earth of the nature of flesh. Saved eight people. Gave them a new beginning. There were eight souls saved on the ark. Eight always is the number for new beginnings. New beginnings. So eight people went into the ark. And they were saved from destruction. They were saved from destruction. While God washed sin away. Washed the effects of sin away. And that's what baptism. Is designed to be for you and I. I ain't even really. Man. Let me rush on. Because <laughs> I got to get you to, to one scripture in the New Testament uh, that is really, really powerful about taking on the nature of Christ. But I want you to know Noah is also one of those word pictures. It shows up in the New Testament as, as a symbol of baptism because God washes the old away and he brings you into a new beginning. A new beginning in your salvation with him. All right. Now I'm going to race not only against the class and the clock, but my computer is going to shut down in about 10 minutes, right on time, <laughs> as the battery is about to run out. First Peter, and I could plug it up, but I won't, because we're going to, we're going to keep the time. We'll be done by noon. First Peter chapter 3, 18 through 20 is where you'll see that. For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the prison, spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. And when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, 
but the answer of, of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Amen. Now, uh, a real quick note here. Just notice what Jesus did. All of these many souls that were there that got washed away in the flood, their life was ended in the earth. But their eternal existence was just beginning. So when Jesus died, the Bible says he went into prison. Uh, in other words, Sheol or hell. He went into, into hell and preached to those souls. And every single person that has ever lived from the beginning of time has had an opportunity to accept or reject Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Ain't God good like that? Every single person that has ever lived from the beginning of time has had an opportunity to hear the gospel of what Jesus did and either accept or reject him. Because even those people that lived and died prior to Christ, Jesus preached to them when he went down into Sheol and they had an opportunity to accept the gospel. My goodness. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 